My name is Dr. Rob Coleman, and on behalf of CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome you to today's educational activity titled Advanced Ovarian Cancer, New Insights on Making the Most of Mutations and Biomarkers to Inform Treatment. Today's program is supported by an educational grant from AstraZeneca Pharmaceuticals and from Merck Sharp Dome uh, uh, Incorporated. Go. Uh, today's activity is uh, brought to you by CME Outfitters, which is a, who is an award-winning, uh, jointly accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians uh, worldwide. Now, I'd like to encourage you, everyone, to join us on our live Twitter conversation at, at CME Outfitters. Uh, we will be monitoring the Twitter feed and responding to your tweets as they come in. One last note, one last item I want to note is that we are using kind of an enhanced platform today that allows you to save slides, take notes on the slides, answer polling questions, and send us your questions. So you don't need to wait until the end of the show to ask questions. Um, we'll be monitoring uh, for the questions during the program. We're more than happy to, to uh, pose them to the faculty uh, during the show. And don't be afraid to challenge them. That's what they're here for. Again, my name is uh, Rob Coleman. I am a Senior Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer for U.S. Oncology Research uh, in the Woodlands, uh, Texas. And I'd like to introduce the faculty, uh, who, whom I, I, I believe you probably know well. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kathleen Moore, who is the Associate Director of Clinical Research. Uh, she is the Director of the Tobacco Settlement um, Endowment um, uh, uh, program that funds the phase one drug development unit at the Stevenson's Cancer Center in Oklahoma City at the University of Oklahoma. She also is the Virginia uh, Curley K Chair in Development Therapeutics and Professor in Gynecological Oncology. Welcome, uh, Katie. It's nice Thanks. to see you. Thanks. So nice to be here. And then, of course, I'd like to uh, also uh, introduce Dr. David O'Malley, who is a uh, professor in the Department of Structural Gynecology. Uh, is the division director at the in the division of gynecologic oncology, and he is the co-director of the G, uh, G1 oncology phase one program at the James uh, at the Ohio State University College of Medicine in Columbus. David, welcome. Oh my God, so excited to be here! I I, I can't I'm I can't tell you how excited I am to be with two of my very uh, best friends and and seriously two of the smartest people I know. Um, on this program. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Look forward to a really robust and uh, interactive program. It's great to have you both here. Thank you. It's going to make it really fun to do. So we have a few learning objectives. Um, I'll just read through these so that you know what we're going to do. Um, we're going to, our first objective is to incorporate germline, uh, understand the, uh, the importance of, of germline and somatic testing uh, and other biomarker testing that's necessary to inform treatment decision-making in uh, ovarian cancer. We're going to evaluate the recent uh, evidence of mutation of biomarker uh, in connection to treatment efficacy. And we're gonna walk through, uh, you know, kind of the natural history of this disease and talk a little bit about um, the important considerations to make good choices on, on therapy. Uh, a lot of this, uh, uh, of what we're gonna present today uh, has been discussed. And so we're kind of hopeful that we'll, with this interactive type of environment, we'll get an opportunity to uh, tackle some of the more uh, difficult questions that come up in kind of the real world. Real world, And so don't be afraid to ask those questions. Um, Dave's made a promise that he's gonna be out there interrogating the entire audience one by one to make sure you guys ask questions. But I just wanna make sure you guys feel comfortable to uh, go ahead and put them up into, into, uh, uh, into, the, uh, into the question section. So this slide here, I think many of you are probably pretty familiar with, you know, when you, when you think about like what, how we come to a treatment decision, there are several factors that we, we think about, right? Newly diagnosed patient shows up in the, in the office, you know, um, uh, we are looking at a number of factors and to try to chart the course that's going to be most efficacious for that patient, including when and how we do uh, surgery, uh, how we handle the surgical outcomes with respect to um, ongoing uh, treatment, how we uh, tackle issues of comorbidities. And then of course, these other factors that come into play, such as genomic you know, profiling, their stage of disease and what the ultimate pathology um, is. All these now can become components of the factors that, um, that, that amalgamate essentially to, to, to develop a, a frontline strategy. And many of us are very familiar with this uh, kind of natural history of the disease. You know, we see patients so frequently who come in with months and months of 
symptoms that are essentially um, not tagged to the di ultimate diagnosis of, of an ovarian cancer. Many of these patients, as you know, um, uh, will complain of common symptoms that uh, can be attributed to multiple different, different um, uh, ailments, including non-cancer uh, ailments. But ultimately, sometime, at some point, people usually end up getting a CAT scan or an ultrasound or something that identifies that something's wrong in the abdomen, and then they do a pelvic exam and determine that uh, maybe this is actually GYN related. Fortunately, it sometimes happens in that sequence. But ultimately, once that diagnosis gets made, we have a plan uh, laid out for, uh, for potential for surgery, and we have to make that decision about whether or not we're going to do this as a primary event or an interval site of reduction. Um, and... Uh, and then we're going to try to plan out the adjuvant therapy. And we have a number of options, which we'll walk through here. Uh, we'll basically follow this, the NCCN guidelines as to how those uh, decisions gets made. And then, of course, we, we treat during that frontline therapy and we look for a, a response. And then at that time of, of response, uh, we have to make a decision about what do we do next? Because we know that there's a high likelihood that patients, even patients who have a complete remission, actually even patients who have a surgical evaluation for the completeness of their response, still have an extraordinarily high rate of recurrence, maybe as much as 40 to 50% in the setting of a pathologic complete response for, for recurrence. And so we, uh, at that point, we oftentimes uh, consider uh, a maintenance strategy, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But for those that patients that unfortunately uh, uh, do uh, suffer a relapse, the next set of, of treatments are then outlined by a number of clinical features that would help us to determine whether or not the type of therapy we would use. And fortunately, this is an area of intense investigation as we continue to try to rewrite the standards, not only for recurrent disease, but ultimately for frontline for the frontline setting. And we use terms like platinum sensitive and platinum resistant. These, as you'll see, are arbitrary decisions um, and arbitrary cut points. You know, nothing magically happens between five months and 29 days and six months and one day. But we do have uh, guidance as to you know, what we think will be the most appropriate therapy in those settings and how that progresses along the way. Now, the story for adjuvant therapy um, in ovarian cancer has been largely written from uh, an initial study that was published in 1996, January 1996, which, was brought, which, which brought us uh, paclitaxel in the frontline setting. You guys may remember GOG 111 uh, was a seminal paper published by Bill McGuire at that time, and he was um, uh, uh, responsible for uh, a trial that was essentially substituting paclitaxel for cyclophosphamide. The paclitaxel that was administered in that trial was given over 24 hours, uh, and it was given with cisplatinum. And it showed an improvement in progression-free and, and overall survival. And quickly, the, the regimen was modified and, and, and put into a situation where that could be taken into the outpatient setting. GOG-158 was the trial that, that confirmed that in a non-inferiority design. Uh, and it's been since replicated over and over again. And we did several multiple studies, more than 12,000 patients randomized in phase three trials, trying to figure out a way to improve upon paclitaxel and carboplatinum. Uh, this trial, ICON-8, actually tried to address another question, which is whether or not dose-dense uh, therapy could improve outcomes over standard Q3 weekly paclitaxel at that time with carboplatin. And you can see here from the results that these three curves, these three arms, dose-dense uh, paclitaxel or dose-dense pac plus dose-dense uh, carbo was better than standard care. And you can see we really didn't see any difference uh, between those regimens. So uh, we, we use this as kind of a starting point uh, to try to interrogate how we might be able to add to this backbone of platinum and paclitaxel. Uh, and we've had two successes along the way that have now kind of changed um, uh, change that upfront standards consideration, and we'll walk you through that. Now, before we get to that, we want to ask you a provocative question, and I'll read it to you. So the question is, following primary treatment with a platinum-based chemotherapy, uh, following chemotherapy resulting in a partial response, in which scenario will HRD testing inform the next steps in therapy decisions? Okay, so this is following primary therapy with a platinum-based chemo, chemo regimen or following platinum-based chemotherapy and it get, you get a partial response, what further testing will actually inform your, uh, inform your decisions uh, uh, with HRD testing? And so you can see here, the choices are where there's, where BRCA1-2 status is wild type, where there's a known BRCA, germline BRCA1-2 mutation, where there's a known somatic 
uh, mutation in BRC1 or 2. When bevacizumab is not used during primary therapy or E, I'm not sure. We'll go ahead and vote. Okay, so it looks like about half of the audience um, basically says they're not sure. This will be uh, good. You can see that um, that three percent of um, of you uh, actually chose the right uh, right response that we were looking for, and that's that we're not where BRC one two status is unknown, or I mean, excuse me, is wild type. So, um, and we'll go through why that's the case. But Dave, I thought I'd start with you. What do you think about uh, about this uh, spread distribution of results? Well, you know, I think it's it, it's really interesting as we look at it, the way that it was worded it was a little confusing, right? In a patient, yeah, like which, I read it which wrong was the like scenario? Well, I know you kind of stunk at that, but that's a different story. <laughs> He's like, I want to read it to you, and everybody I pull <laughs> I was like, was like stop reading it to me, man. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't, I'm okay. Anyway, you've been in any. I won't say anything about being in Houston. Anyway, so we have this we, we have this scenario where you say, okay, when do I want HRD testing? Yeah. And, and I would argue you want HRD testing and BRCA germline and somatic in every single advanced ovarian cancer patient. But mm -hmm. the way that this was written was when would it really be, when would it tell you something different? Because if they're mm -hmm. BRCA positive somatic or germline, right? Mm -hmm. Then you don't need the HRD because they're by definition, HRD, HRD positive, right. we'll call HRD, right? Yeah. So yeah. Th when this helps is if they're wild type, so they're not BRCA mutated or RAD51 CRD, you could argue, but we won't get into that mm -hmm. quite yet. Okay. So in that scenario, that's when you go, okay, I want more information to really help me decide what my next steps are. And we, we're going to debate, you know, what those next steps are. And, and, and there's lots of different ways mm -hmm. to play this, but that is a very important. The way this question was written was a little confusing. Yeah. Katie, any, uh, any comments? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> I don't disagree with how it was read being confusing, um, but um, just kidding. <laughs> Thank so you. I think that one of the There's things- a, yeah, I'm here all week. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll be here all, nice all nice night. Um, Hopefully he, just, he just stops reading. Yeah. I think that one of the things that is key in the question is when does HRD in, like define the next steps and when does it not? And so here, you know, um, and we'll talk about this. So for patients who are in response to therapy, you can use a PARP inhibitor because that's what we're talking about today in any way. Right. You know, so right. HRD actually doesn't inform the indication for H for um, PARP inhibitor. And, and, yeah. and I have some thoughts on that, but but the label is, it doesn't inform it unless you have started bevacizumab. So right. if you've started bevacizumab, then HRD, which I use a lot, HRD actually is really important because you can only layer on the PARP inhibitor for the Paola regimen, and you're going to hear about that in a moment, in HRD positive tumors, inclusive of BRCA. So the only setting in which HRD truly like determines, can you or can you not use mm -hmm. a PARP is in the setting where you have started bevacizumab. And I'm not making an argument, please don't misunderstand me to not use bevacizumab because I like that agent, Yeah. but that is the setting. Um, we'll talk yeah. about those nuances. Yeah, and that's that's really key. And I thank you for both uh, uh, in that response. I think that <clears throat> it was it was tricky because um, you, you're right. You don't need to know this information to actually use a PARP inhibitor. I mean, that's the key. You can you can use a PARP inhibitor. We'll talk about this. You can use a PARP inhibitor in patients that are HRD status unknown, mm -hmm. and and as as such, a third of those patients will have HRD. So, uh, in and what I'm talking about is the biomarker, the the BRCA wild type patient population, a third of the remaining patients will have an HRD. So you get it right by not, by not, but if you're a stickler to wanting to use PARP in the, bio, in the biological way where you think it's going to be efficacious, um, then you can use that to inform whether or not you're going to use a PARP or not. But I agree with you that if you have not started BEV, it's a, it's a decision that you, you're essentially trying to compare it to use nothing or to use something. And I think yeah. the easy Can I just argue back to you a little bit is yeah. that, and I think we're gonna talk about this, but this is a key point that I, I really like to make because I've actually learned it a lot actually from listening to our partner, partner and friend, Brad Monk, is that if you wanna be a stickler and get biomarkers to determine when you're gonna use a PARP, 
you have to be a stickler about the clinical biomarkers as well. And the mm -hmm. clinical biomarker of response to frontline chemo in settings where you have that information and you don't have it in everyone, but you do have it in 50% who are getting new adjuvant. That's probably more important in my mind. And we can argue with that. You can fight me on it, but um, you're going to be a Got stickler, to. be a stickler for both. Yeah. And I would say also, you're also placing complete confidence that the test is accurate. And, and we all know that these tests have both false negatives and false positives. So, But, but um, let me go a little bit different here. Uh -huh. Okay. So I, I think it's a really good point that Katie brings up, but I, I don't think we need to say being a stickler. I mean, I, we, as we look at this, we absolutely have to know, is somebody germ, uh, uh, is BRCA positive? Right. So I want to make sure 100%. every we, we know that what we have to know that. So you have to do testing. I advocate doing germline and somatic with the somatic testing. You get the HRD. Let's talk about the people we absolutely should do part for. BRCA, we're going to talk about this solo one without debate, Prima without debate. Right. You need <laughs> a, a part. But in the HRD population, if you it, it, again, you, you, I believe without debate, you need a PARP. And I know Katie, I think what I know what Katie's going to say next with, without debate, you need a PARP and HRD. Some debate in the HR proficient or HRD negative group, or in this case, unknown, as you said, Rob. So for me, I want to make sure I identify those patients without debate that I want to use a PARP. And that's why I advocate for mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, the HRD testing as well as the BRCA germline. Right. And or, I think a point that. Adjustment. Absolutely. And I think a point that both of you brought up is essentially is, is that, um, is that platinum response since platinum works in a similar mechanism, not identical, but in a similar mechanism that relies on homologous recombination for, um, for, for repair. If, if, if the tumor is deficient in, in that repair, for whatever reason, then they're more likely to respond to platinum. Right. Um, and that's, and so you can use it as a surrogate. I think that's what she was talking about clinical biomarker. Is right. it a surrogate? And we know that the resistance mechanisms are not the same. There are some, a lot of overlap, um, but, um, but it's something to keep in mind. And that's, I think, a, a, key, a key point. So let me move us along here because I think, Dave, you said this. You're like, hey, listen, everybody should be tested. Well, you know, all of the major societies agree with you. Uh, this has now been put into the guidelines that all of these patients uh, who uh, have this diagnosis should have uh, at, at, a, at a minimum, some assessment of their BRCA status. In many parts of the world, this is not uh, universally available. Uh, sometimes it's only the germline testing that can be done because tumor testing is too expensive. But in the United States, um, it's uh, uh, pretty much attainable. Uh, not only can you get both the germline and the tumor assessment for BRCA, but as Dave mentioned, you can also get HRD testing uh, all in the same sampling. Uh, and so that will be, you know, the best uh, annotation that we have today of uh, alterations that we would see that would help us to find that. And again, NCCN, SGO, ASCO, ESMO, um, all the societies as go as well, uh, agree that this should be uh, the, the modality. Now, a lot of what we have said today um, is around the use of PERP inhibitors. And um, as is usually the case, uh, we do development in patients who have recurrent measurable disease. Uh, and so what's, what you're seeing here um, are the approved, uh, the, the PARP inhibitors that are approved under the setting of treatment. So patients that come with recurrent disease have cancer that you can see. You give them a PARP inhibitor and the tumors get smaller. So these um, particular drugs, the Recaprim, Neraparib, and um, uh, Neraparib uh, have all uh, had this interrogation done uh, demonstrating that they can shrink tumors in various different settings. You can see the objective response rates are slightly different because they do represent different patient populations. Um, and, and the point here isn't really to get into a big discussion about the use of PARP in recurrent, uh, in recurrent disease settings, but that they shrink tumors. Mm -hmm. So the, the concept here was that, okay, if this agent has, as a single agent, can actually shrink tumors, in this case, that are annotated by a biomarker that is available. Uh, so in, the, in two of these studies, it was by the, uh, uh, the attestation of a BRCA mutation uh, in Olaparib as a germline, in Recaparib in the, in the somatic, and in Olaparib as the testing for HRD, that they all will shrink tumors in these various different categories. So our next step was then to use that um, in a way that would um, allow us to extend the therapy of, uh, of a platinum-based response. 
And we called that switch maintenance therapy. And so all three of these drugs were tested in various different studies against uh, best of care, best standard of care, which was observation in the platinum sensitive space. So these, these trials, um, uh, uh, SOLO2 and say 19 Ariel3 and uh, NOVA, uh, respectively, for the three drugs that you see on the slide, were all tested in the setting of patients who have platinum-sensitive uh, recurrent disease, were given a platinum-based regimen and responded to it, and then they were randomized to a PARP inhibitor versus uh, placebo. And what they showed, all of these, all of these, each of these trials showed, was that there was a reduction, a substantial reduction, something we had hardly seen before, a reduction in the recurrence risk in those patients. So progression-free survivals were extended in all three of those studies. So we just took the concept of shrinking tumors that we can see to delaying the progression of tumors we can't see. And actually in Ariel 3, we did a sub-study looking at patients that actually had measurable disease after the completion of platinum-based therapy and demonstrated in the annotated subgroups that they actually shrunk tumors further. So again, the, the concept of maintenance being uh, um, moved uh, into the uh, earlier line of, of, of sensitive disease. And so this became really relevant, a proof of mechanism uh, that we wanted to tag to our increasing knowledge of what was happening with newly diagnosed ovarian cancers uh, with respect to their genomic profile. And you've seen this uh, slide a lot. Uh, lots of us use it because it's nice to see where the mutation and alterations in the genes that govern the process that we're actually targeting for the use of a PARP inhibitor. And that is the homologous recombination pathway, which is a high fidelity, energy intensive repair pathway that um, can use the knowledge or, or the uh, reading of a sister chromatid to provide the missing transcript of, the, of one strand of the DNA to provide for accurate repair. When we, when we look at these uh, ovarian cancers, we can see that newly diagnosed patients that around 15 to 20% of these patients have an alteration in their germline for BRCA, another uh, three, for, three to 5% of those patients have an alteration specifically in the tumor itself, but not, don't carry it in the germline. And then you can see that there are alterations of a number of the governance genes uh, for the homologous recombination pathway. And so because this frequency is so high, it really places a premium on knowing that status. So all three of us have basically agreed that this is so vital to the uh, treatment paradigm for patients with ovarian cancer, because not only can we identify these patients accurately, but we have a therapy that's aligned with it that has demonstrated efficacy in shrinking tumors in the recurrent setting, delaying progression in the recurrent setting, and ultimately delaying progression in the frontline setting. So having said that, you know, I wanna walk you through the current most recent NCCN guidelines that kind of um, have now taken all of this information and kind of put it uh, together for us uh, uh, in a way. And I'll walk you through how these decisions got, uh, got set up and made. So you can see here um, at the left-hand side, we have a patient with advanced stage of ovarian cancer uh, who has standard workup. And so the very first decision, um, and you heard uh, Dr. Morris mention it, is that she uh, likes to use bevacizumab in these patients. And many of us uh, do believe the data that has come from the two frontline trials that evaluated uh, bevacizumab in the frontline in, in, in patients with newly diagnosed ovarian cancer, and those are GOG218 and ICON7. So you can see here on this graphic um, that the uh, GOG218 was a three-arm trial, uh, placebo-controlled where bevacizumab was added to concomitantly with chemotherapy uh, and was in one of the arms, and then was in the third arm was added with chemotherapy and in maintenance. So there wasn't a fourth arm in this trial that was actually studied, but there was, um, although it was proposed, <laughs> it was dropped, uh, unfortunately, but um, you can see that of these three arms that there was um, an improvement in the median PFS uh, uh, for uh, the combination of bevacizumab given during chemotherapy and in the maintenance setting. No difference in the, at, at least at the medians here in the overall survival, but you can see there was a, a benefit between 14 months and the control arm, which was the uh, placebo control arm. And ICON-7, not dissimilar, um, except there was no placebo. It was a shorter duration and different dose of bevacizumab. But the arm that was the comparator arm uh, for the experimental arm was giving bevacizumab during chemotherapy and bevacizumab for maintenance. And it was compared to standard of care at the time, which was packed with with just observation. And again, you can see there's an improvement 
in progression-free survival. And this was, uh, both of these arms uh, basically showed statistically significantly different. Now, one thing I always like to highlight with these trials, you can see that the numbers for ICON-7 are generally higher in the two cohorts than they are in 218, both for PFS and overall survival. And this is a, a reflection of the types of patients that were enrolled in each of these two trials. So uh, most importantly is if you look at the control arm of both studies, you can see there's dramatic difference between the paclitaxel caroplatinum placebo arm uh, or the no, no treatment arm uh, between the two trials. So again, demonstrates the difference in the patient populations. But if you're a believer in this data, you can see that the first checkpoint in this, in this algorithm after the diagnosis is whether or not you add bevacizumab. And the data that would support the bevacizumab if you're a believer are based on the, uh, what we can see in that, in that study. Now, if you are not a believer in bevacizumab, then you go up to the upper part of this, of this graphic. And the next step that will be interrogated for your treatment decision is whether or not these patients have an alteration in BRCA. Again, so you can see this is why it's important to get this information. Now, the data that would support understanding this, um, this differentiation uh, comes from the fact, as I mentioned before, that the, that the BRCA status uh, in the uh, tumor is gonna be critically important to the use of a PERP inhibitor based on the studies that have, been, that have been done. And you can see in SOLO1 and in PRIMA, which are both trials that looked at patients who had responded to a platinum-based induction therapy, then randomized to um, a PERP inhibitor versus placebo. Both of these trials showed a substantial improvement in progression-free survival uh, uh, over, over control. And so that would be informing that second step uh, in the treatment algorithm. So these are the, just to give you a, a sense of what those curves and what they look like, um, this is the, um, uh, the, the, the patient population that was annotated by BRCA mutation. And you can see in SOLA1, the hazard ratio of 0.3, and in PRIMA, the hazard ratio of 0.43. Now, again, these do represent different uh, populations uh, in general, um, at, they're at-risk populations but you can see that the, the treatment effect is consistent between the both of these, representing a 60 to 70% reduction in the hazard for progression at any point of exposure. So again, highly significant and making a, making a lot of difference. So Rob, now, we, have some, yeah. we, we have some questions coming in. So okay. I think this is a good time. It may be a little premature, but we have some questions coming in. One of which is, and I think this is a good time, we're talking about Solo One versus Prima. You know, how long are you going to utilize the PARP inhibitor in, in, in a BRCA patient or in any patient you start in the front line? And then, Matt, Katie, then talk about what your thought is in platinum sensitive maintenance. And then maybe I can come in if you're going to use it for treatment. We've kind of said we want to use PARP inhibitor for the earlier, the better, right? But that's some of the questions coming in are revolving around how long are you going to use it? And do you give them holidays during this time? What, what, what do you do? I think this is a good time for the solo one and the Prima up there. Can, can you talk to, to how long you're, you're going to be utilizing? Yeah, so um, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, the, you know, for both of these trials, there was, an up, there was a cap on the upper limit of, of therapy. So in solo one, uh, it was two years and in Prima it was three years. Um, and I think it was probably a reasonable thing to do since we don't know what the long-term toxicity is in a patient who potentially is cured. Um, and, and I think that- um, Not many uh, of them. What? Not many of them. Well, let's hope, you, you know, let's hope we prove you wrong with your solo. No, I mean, line. like a baseline, not many of oh, them. Oh, yeah, yeah, cured. that's what I'm saying, right, yeah. yeah. And so, but one of the things that I always point out, and I don't know, you know, again, how valid this is, but you can see that the, that the curves on both of these um, examples basically become parallel uh, after a certain point in time. And so the question is, if the event rate is the same between um, the experimental arm and the control arm after a certain point in time, you have you basically reached the maximal benefit you're going to see with exposure. It's hard to know that. We would have to actually formally test it. But you can see that after about 12 to 15 months in SOLA1, and basically after about 10 months, eight to 10 months in Prima, the curves are essentially the event rate, the number of patients progressing as a proportion of those that have not progressed is actually about the same. And so the question is, you know, do you get more benefit by just continuing on treatment? Well, so, we may so, not. So I don't so, know. So Solo one. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I apologize. Solo one Sorry. treated for two years, Prima treated for three. But I hear you saying is 
you're going to make sure that you get at least if you can a year and a half of therapy or so it no, so 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 katie sticks with the two years solo one three years if she's using prima and rapper i'm with you katie i stick with the i stick with the what, what the phase three data shows I, but I just had a patient this week who said, you know, the fatigue starting to get to me. Usually, you know, once you get through those first few months, the fatigue is, is, is uh, stable. But I had a, uh, that conversation, Rob, that you're just having right now to say, I think we've gotten the maximum benefit. We need to, 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 to weigh the risk and benefit. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, Katie. I'm trying to get two or three years on that. At times, if they need a break, I'm willing to give them a break. In this particular patient, she was at, at about 18, almost 19 months. We went ahead and decided to discontinue based on just kind of chronic toxicity. But Katie, how about platinum sensitive? We're going to get there, but I think since this question was asked by the audience, it'd be a good thing to, to, to talk uh, about a little bit more. Sure. So um, can I just comment on front line? I just, I really would hesitate to put that out there that it's okay to make things up. So the data is two years or three years. So, so I really wanna be cautious about sort of applying exploratory analyses of these survival curves you know, to patients until we see sort of overall survival from solo one. And that's a very particular population. And we can talk about that a little more. It's very different than Prima, very mm -hmm. different clinically. Right. So we can talk to that. So I just wanna make that point. Please don't plan for a right. year or a year and a half. You're planning right. for two. Mm -hmm. And in a prima population, I would plan for three because that's a very different population that was in that was in solo. In a platinum sensitive setting, I do treat her uh, according to the trials, which is indefinite treatment until progression, uh, because that's really how they were designed. And um, solo two and um, uh, Nova were an aerial three. You know, I'll look at this. We've seen overall survival data for two of those studies. And in the BRCA-associated cancers, it's nominally superior. We can argue about the statistics, but a year is a year. And so it is, it is superior. Um, I'm interested, though, in this group. And again, I don't act differently, but, um, but I am interested in this group because I think as we use more and more maintenance therapies repetitively, we have more of these women who fortunately, I wish they're cured, number one, but a lot of them aren't, and they get platinum and they get a maintenance and do really well and they get platinum again. So how many of you are seeing third and fourth and even fifth line platinum? Because we're really extending that platinum free interval out. Mm -hmm. And, and I am a little bit cautious about, I'm thinking more about the risk of secondary um, tumor related myeloid neoplasms with continuous use of part versus the potential overall survival benefit. So I wish I could stop it, to be honest, Mm -hmm. Dave, um, you know, when I, especially in Dr. Coleman will hate me for saying this because I have done some secondary side reductions and my patients with BRCA who had oligometastases and I resected them and gave them chemo again. And now they're on two years of PARP and they're completely NED. So we're even following CT DNA. How about adding that to like no evidence? Mm -hmm. and it's all negative. Gosh, I would like to stop. Yeah. But I'm not going to stop unless the patient really wants to. So I think you have to follow the data. Um, yeah. But I really yeah. want to know, and I'm not sure how to design the trial. I want to know if there's some patients that I don't have to treat for seven years. Yeah. Right? And that's, and I think that is, you know, I, I started having that conversation at either two or three years in that scenario. You know, so many of those patients go in with partial responses and continue to be maintained partial responses. That's they have a partial yeah. response. I continue therapy indefinitely. Mm -hmm. So the, the third question, which I asked, which is how about that patient who came in for some reason, never had somatic or BRCA testing, never had a PARP. Okay. And you discover that and you use part for treatment, which one of your you know, earlier slides show clearly in that patient population, if they're deriving benefit, I'm going to treat until progression or, or unacceptable toxicity. So oh, yeah. sorry for interrupting you, Rob, but no, I, 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 questions it, were it, popping in. I thought it would be good to address. No, it's a great. No, absolutely. No, I think it's great. And I, and I, and I want to, I want to underscore and, and in bold cap, uh, what Katie mentioned about, you know, deviating from the protocols. You know, we, we do this a lot because in real world, we have patients that don't meet the criteria for our patients, but we have to, you can't change the trial. Uh, uh, you can't change the way you treat a patient off of the trial and expect that you're going to get the same results of the trial. So you have, to, you, have to, you have to stay aligned with that. If you believe the data, you're treating it on the basis of it, you really need to follow it um, until we have better guidance as to, uh, as to what to do. 
So that um, very, very good point uh, to bring up. And again, <laughs> to that same point, we have all these subgroups that are, you know, non-analytical um, that we're going to be, you know, demonstrating uh, the, the consistency of effect. I don't want to, you know, again, these were uh, not uh, uh, entirely done uh, with, uh, with alpha allocated to it, with the exception of the Velia trial here. But um, Velia, it was a, a trial, a three-arm trial uh, modeled very much after GOG-218, its design. So just to substituting voliparib, a PARP inhibitor, for where bevacizumab was. Um, and, um, and it basically showed in these patients that had evidence of, of a HRD tumor, whether it was um, uh, uh, in, in the setting of, of, of lack of BRCA annotations. These are wild-type patients with BRCA who had evidence of HRD. And again, just like we saw in the recurrent setting, uh, uh, where we actually treated patients that were HRD positive, uh, or tumors that were HRD positive, uh, we found that this treatment will shrink tumors. And in these studies, you can see it delayed uh, progression. And then, but of Rob, course, but yeah. Rob, yeah, you, 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 so, so one of the questions in the chat was, okay, can we use PARP with chemo? So you just said we could. Could you clarify that with uh, with, with, with what's available in in the, in the market yeah. right now? I know you did in, in, yeah. in with Vilia, but can, yeah. can we can can we talk a little bit more about that? Right. So the concept of using chemotherapy with a PARP inhibitor was actually studied um, in, in, a, uh, in the recurrent setting first. Uh, Jonathan Letterman read that, led that trial. And, um, and what it was looking at was the use of a laparib with pac paxone carboplatinum. And they basically showed that it was uh, cyto uh, had a lot of cytotoxicity uh, and required reduction of both platinum and PARP to get through the chemotherapy arm, but did show a difference uh, once, the, once the chemotherapy was stopped and the PARP was continued. So LAPR was continued on past um, uh, the finish, finishing of chemotherapy versus patients that just had chemotherapy alone. And so if you looked at that study carefully, you could see there was almost no difference between the two arms, uh, although there were very few events during the chemotherapy but then showed a split of the curves after they stopped the chemotherapy. Again, basically showing the benefit of maintenance. Well, Velia showed very much the same thing. So we had to use a reduced dose of the PARP inhibitor uh, of Liprib, which is also not a very strong PARP trapper. So we were able to give this, but we gave it with full dose chemotherapy. And so uh, once these patients uh, completed their chemotherapy, the dose was increased and we used Liprib versus placebo. Uh, so it can be given but it usually has to be given um, at a compromise of, of, of dosing. Uh, and, and I should just note parenthetically that this triplet is in, in Velia, uh, Bilipirib is not approved uh, in the United States. So, so, so it's- So, so let, 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 let me paraphrase for this. That was the longest answer ever to, to <laughs> say no, okay? Outside of a clinical trial, do not put PARP with chemotherapy. It's horribly cytotoxic. It's very hard to tolerate. The answer is no. I, I know you're holding on to Vilia. I know you're holding on, buddy. But no, we're not going to try. We're Caprib, Neraprib, Elaprib. We're not yeah. combining with chemotherapy outside of a clinical trial. Okay, so you can All talk. True. You can, you you spent five minutes to to confuse well, everybody. The, the answer is, is no. The answer is somebody no. will try it. Somebody will try it. So <laughs> exactly. Let me soft. let me paraphrase. The answer is no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So I agree with you for the first time. Um, so, uh, and then there are the trials that had, you know, and, and the reason we're profiling Prima and Velia is that Solo One had all only patients who had tumors that were annotated by BRCA mutation. So these are patients that did not fit, were not included in, in Solo One. That's why we're showing Velia and, and Prima. So this is the group of patients that have test negative. Uh, they're, um, and they were defined differently, I should, I should mention. Uh, Velia used a different cut, cutoff score for the HRD testing uh, than Prima, but you can see that there is um, some separation uh, between those curves, but um, much less than we saw in the HR uh, deficient um, or test, test negative patients, or test positive cases. This is the case, if you go back one second, Rob, I think this is one of the things that we've really learned from this population. And you showed the platinum sensitive studies kind of briefly at the mm -hmm. beginning. And I just want to remind folks that the platinum sensitive approvals were obtained in women who had platinum sensitive recurrent disease, got a platinum, responded really, really well, mm -hmm. and then got this. Not the same population as in the bevacizumab studies where you included patients um, from the beginning of chemotherapy. And so 
there is not a small proportion of patients who discontinue due to stable disease or progression. And they were all included in those survival or those PFS curves in the platinum sensitive settings. And so that's why that clinical biomarker of response to platinum kind of trumped, I know we're not supposed to use that term, but it's like um, <laughs> the biomarker in the platinum sensitive space, it showed you a gradation of benefit, but it didn't show you a yes, no. And now right. we come to the front line with Prima, which is positive and has the all comer indication. But again, remember that Prima, and I don't know if you're gonna show this um, Rob, but Prima was an incredibly high clinical risk population. 70% of the patients were dispositioned to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. I've never seen that high a, a percentage right. of neoadjuvant on any mm -hmm. frontline trial, even Chorus, which was testing neoadjuvant, only had 50%. So 70%, like almost 40% were stage four. But despite that, so they're high risk, despite that, to come on Prima, they had to respond really, really well to their platinum. And then they could come on to Prima and get Norap over placebo. So irrespective of what the, the assay says, HRP, tumors are already inherent vulnerability. Some, some insensitivity, yeah. That's no. exactly right. Right, yeah. which is why this isn't, to my mind, an all comers indication. It is still a selected population if you have that clinical biomarker. Now, if you've resected someone, which you should do, please please don't take this as an argument for doing neoadjuvant. Um, and they have no gross residual, you have to make your best decision. And of course I would err on the side of, of um, niraparib in that setting. But if you have that information, it tells you a lot if that tumor has not responded to platinum, they're not gonna benefit from a PARP in my opinion. That's right. Okay, so that's key. I, I wanna make sure everybody kind of caught that. Um, so what Katie is emphasizing is that in, in, in Velia, patients were randomized at diagnosis. So after surgery, they were then put on Pactax carboplatinum for their six cycles and then randomized to, uh, and, then, and then continued on their, uh, the randomized arm with a PERP inhibitor uh, or, or a placebo. Now, if you look at the curve at the top here, you can see at 100% at, at time zero, those are all the patients who are randomized. And you can see they trend down in both arms during chemotherapy. So these patients are not included in Prima. They're not included right. in solo one. Right. So, so, so this, these curves are fundamentally different than what was seen in Prima. So, so, so what Katie said, if you listen carefully, what she said was that it's not an indication for all comers. Okay. So we use that term a lot. If you, if you're, if you're, if your start point for quote unquote all comers is the completion of chemotherapy, that means in a biomarker unrestricted situation. But if you're talking about all comers like Velia all comers, that's not what was assessed in Prima. Those patients responded to treatment. Okay. Right. So what, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish that thought. Yeah. So again, so, so the biomarker here, uh, uh, irrespective of BRCA status and HRD status is platinum sensitivity and right. platinum response. Right. Key it's point. Key. It's a key point. But but it's much harder to tell in the upfront setting. And that's why I that's right. really like the HRD, particularly with surgery, uh, interval or primary uh, tumor reductive surgery, because you're artificially improving your platinum response. If you have somebody who progresses, if you have somebody who doesn't respond, clearly that's not a patient who should be going on a PARP inhibitor in my mind. Okay. Now saying that, what's really interesting, look in the platinum sensitive, we don't talk that much about this, but we probably need to. So it, it, you are hearing us, you know, we're drinking the Kool-Aid, right? We think. <laughs> <laughs> that maintenance therapy in the upfront setting, absolutely. And you hear many of us use you know, you, you, that we use PARP in, in uh, many different patients. If you didn't use PARP in the upfront setting, and then in the platinum sensitive, they get a very good platinum response, which again, we don't do as much surgery as we used to in those patients. Mm -hmm. You have the clinical biomarker. You have the mm -hmm. clinical. So in that case, I don't put as much weight in the HRD testing in the recurrent setting. And that I put a lot more in the clinical biomarker of platinum sensitivity because mm -hmm. I'm following those patients from usually a little higher volume disease down. And if you get a complete response and we'll see some data coming out of some uh, trials, um, if we get a complete response, they almost behave like a BRCA mutated uh, tumor. Mm -hmm. 
right? I mean, right. it's amazing. Bulky gonna, disease going down to small volume absolutely. is 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 yeah. a, is 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 Something wonderful on biomarker, mm-hmm. clinical biomarker. So in the recurrent yeah. setting, you respond, and they didn't get a PARP up front. You got to think that patient needs to get a PARP one hundred percent. There you go. Okay. I'm going to move us along because we're, uh, we're, I, there's so we have so much stuff to talk about and we have great interaction here. So this is really good. And thank you audience for sending in the questions. Please, please, please continue. We'll get to them. Dave's uh, is monitoring that, that um, the, the question error area. So moving then on to, uh, again, if we have all of our data in front of us, you can see the patients that are, um, who are not started on BEV and are wild type um, and uh, if they uh, develop a response uh, to that induction therapy, it's just as Dave said, if, 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 and Katie said, uh, that if these patients are good candidates for consideration of Mirapirib, it's approved in this indication, um, uh, and or you, know, you can observe. And there are people out there who believe that these patients are just as well served in, to uh, observe. Um, I don't think any of the three of us <laughs> agree with that, but it's certainly uh, an option. And certainly if patients do not wanna go on therapy, um, that is completely fine. These pa- and that would be standard of care, especially if these patients have had a complete response to their induction treatment. So I have a question from the audience. I want to yes. throw this out for Katie because I think, okay, so the patient gets a PR, PR, yeah. okay? And she's BRCA. I think that we're talking about BRCA, right? She gets a mm-hmm. PR and you start her on a PARP. Are you going to, con- if, if, if that patient doesn't convert to a CR, are you going to continue? How long do you continue do you expect to see a response? When would you stop that patient who's coming in into treatment on a PR? Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, honestly, that's the patient in a BRCA population. We didn't have many of these um, on um, solo that came in with PRs. The PRs were really minor, you know, like the CA125 was like 25 instead of 21 kind of thing. So it was a very different population. But um, we did about 12% of women enrolled on solo one who at the two year mark when they came in still had some evidence of disease that was being controlled by whatever they were allocated to PARP or, or norepirib two to one and they were allowed to to remain on and so I think I would follow that to be honest um, I would be very um, you know I I'm kind of a stickler about two years and I I don't really think you should treat forever in the frontline population especially in a in a solo one population type and hopefully we'll talk about that it's it's a very different population than Prima. Two years is enough, except in patients that still have, you know, we've all seen it. The C125 just never normalizes, or they have peritoneal thickening, or some kind of liver capsular thing, and you pet it. Um, I use that as a verb, and it still lights <laughs> up, but it's not growing. I'm going to hold that patient on, on PARP, unfortunately, because I don't have tool, better tools. Maybe CTNA will help us someday. I hope it will. I think this is the maintenance duration is one of the places where I think CTDNA could actually help us make good decisions for patients in the future, but we need to trial. Um, but I would continue in that particular patient, very high risk patients um, who were not enrolled on a lot of these studies, I would continue. But patients who meet study criteria, I am very, two years is enough. And I stop. You know, yeah. I, and and the, the question to me becomes, and, and I don't think we don't need to address that right now, but at two years, if there's still a PR, what do you do? For me, if I have a patient who's a PR in the upfront or platinum sensitive, and mm-hmm. I start them on a PARP inhibitor and they are not progressing and clinically they're tolerating it, I continue indefinitely. We could have the two, two, two or yeah. three year debate in the upfront setting, but what else do they have? They're right. essentially platinum refractory from our previous, you know, our previous mm-hmm. definitions, which is a, a, a non-CR after primary therapy, right? Yeah. It's just so hard because we don't have good tools. Dave. We have, Sometimes we call it by a lymph node or these capsular yeah. involvement and it's hard yeah. to biopsy. And yeah. so you just never know. And you keep treating these women. Who knows if they actually have disease? Like I'm no magician here in figuring that out. Um, but, and so and that's a go good point. On. I guess yeah. a patient, yeah. Yeah. And the patient who, I guess the question is that we are convinced the patient who has some thickening or, you know, that 1.1 centimeter perioric lymph node, you're not sure what it is. Yeah. That's a yeah. little, that, that to me is where the, the, the art comes in and the discussion right. on that. But right. if they're not progressing and they're tolerating it, I would continue 
until at least the criteria of that two to three years in the upfront setting yeah. versus indefinitely in the recurrent. So the, uh, yeah. before we move on, because I know we have, we're behind Rob, but the other thing I just want to, because I don't think we're going to talk about this in going through our slides, but the reason we're kind of really thinking about this, this is a big clinical place of clinical equipoise because mm -hmm. so many patients are not, real world patients are not clinical trial patients. We can all agree that. And you get to the two-year mark or the three-year mark on Prima and you're like, mm, you know, I should just continue indefinitely. And patients sometimes don't want to stop. Mm -hmm. And what we don't, don't know this. If mm -hmm. you don't stop her, are you going to help her? If you don't stop her, are you going to set her up for a more resistant tumor when she recurs? Mm -hmm. She likely will if you're that worried. And we have early suggestions that the response to subsequent platinum is not as robust in patients who progressed on a PARP, at least, as compared to those who haven't progressed on a PARP, as compared to those who got two years apart, stopped for a number of years, hopefully, and then got it. And so what I'm worried about is sort of making decisions because I'm nervous, which we all do. I do. I treat myself half the time, I feel like, because I'm like, mm, this is <laughs> one. Mm -hmm. But what we don't know is, are we, are we harming her down the line? And that really is what we need to figure out coming forward. So I really think you have to stick in the front line when they have not yet recurred to the, the study designated time periods, even if it makes you nervous, unless there's evidence of disease that you're controlling, and then you're not maintaining and you're just maintaining, you're treating her. This isn't mm -hmm. maintenance anymore. Yeah, it's right. You're, you're in treatment phase. You're yeah. treating her. You're just treating yeah. her. It's kind of second line almost, but don't call it that because it disqualifies her from other trials. <laughs> um, but, um, but otherwise, stop until we have some emerging data. That's PARPs are amazing. Frontline is where you want to use them 100%. Don't try to save it. Please stop that. Um, please stop that. But stop it two or three um, until we know what impact of forever PARP. I'm a little worried what we're going to see when we see real world data of women being treated for too long. For too long. Yeah. You know, and we had, we had addressed, I know we had to get going, but this is a great topic. Um, you know, we're, we are now assessing, looking for, uh, for uh, clonal effects in, in, in marrow to, to, to identify patients who are at risk for uh, MDS and AML. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. So this chip analysis, I think, will help us to potentially identify these patients at high risk um, and, and provide some better guidance yep. uh, for duration of treatment. Yep. Okay, so let me, uh, let me move on here. Um, the, the, the next one is pretty easy. These are patients that are not on BEV who have a, a germline or somatic mutation and who have responded to treatment. And we've talked this extensively, uh, both Mirapiv and Laprib are approved. Um, in the patients whom, in whom you've started on bevacizumab, so we're going to go to the other side of the equation here, and we talked about why you might or might not use it. So the next annotation event here will be whether or not these patients um, have uh, a BRCA mutation or not, um, and, uh, and we've demonstrated the, the merit of, of using uh, these two uh, drugs, laparib and niraparib, in patients who have had a uh, response to chemotherapy. Now, this particular cohort of patients have had BEV. Um, and so there are, there are situations where you can stop uh, that therapy and use this. It would still fall under this um, analytic. But if we take this patient population who is wild type uh, for BRCA and on started on BEV, so you can got your, you got your surgery, you got your chemotherapy in BEV in cycle two, and it's ongoing, and these patients have had a response, you can annotate this population further with HRD testing. And this is what Dave was talking about earlier on in the discussion. Where if we find out that these uh, that these uh, that these tumors are uh, homologous recombination proficient or test negative, then you can continue the BEV just as you would if you would if you were a believer in bevacizumab based on ICON seven and GOG two eighteen. However, if they show HR deficiency and are BRCA wild type, they you can add a laparib uh, per PALA one, and this is the data that supported that in the box up here where this was a randomized trial. Of, of comparing um, exocarboplatinum uh, and bevacizumab with the addition of a lab rib or placebo at the completion of, uh, of chemotherapy demonstrating non-progression. And you can see there's a, there's a significant benefit. Um, this is the patient um, population uh, for which uh, the intent to treat population was positive uh, as well as the subgroup that was ultimately led to the approval. Um, here's the uh, reason for why that happened. 
in PALA1, you can see the uh, HRD test positive BRCA um, uh, uh, patients that, that um, uh, were either had a mutation or were wild type. You can see the curves are, are, are widely split. The hazard, the, the um, uh, hazard ratios are highly significant. And then at the medians, you can see the differences in there uh, at, at that midpoint. Uh, and the, but in the HRD test negative cohorts, you can see the curves are relatively overlapping. The FDA chose to carve out this patient population, which is why uh, the uh, drug uh, combination has the indication in patients that have uh, HRD test positive uh, uh, tumors. And then the last uh, uh, part of this curve is, is if you have um, uh, a patient uh, who uh, you have started bevacizumab and they're identified as having a mutation, those patients would be also eligible because they are by definition HRD. Uh, and you can add a lap rib, or as I mentioned, you can add um, uh, a lap rib or a rib. Uh, it would also be the case. I personally am not a big fan of stopping bevacizumab, but you can see you can make the case for it um, since most of the toxicity is, is actually captured in the chemotherapy combination component of it. But there are other reasons for why you might want to uh, not have an IV therapy. So here's what we walked through. We have the red box is, is a choice that's been made. So BEV or no BEV. The next two boxes are essentially around the biological, it's gonna be the genomic annotation. So BRCA mutation and then HRD status. And this is how it all fits together. And if you put all the data together, you can see that these molecularly annotated um, uh, uh, populations uh, are, are uh, show benefit to these drugs. This is the value of a predictive biomarker as opposed to just a prognostic biomarker. In this case, we have a biomarker that actually serves both contexts, but mm -hmm. in patients who have the alteration and got the drug, they got a benefit. And all those long bars that over their controls basically show those benefits. And I've asterisked on this slide, if you're downloading it, I've asterisked the, um, the particular analyses that are, um, that are analytical, they uh, uh, have alpha associated with their analysis. So you can look at that uh, more carefully uh, in your spare time. Yep. Okay, so let's go to the last uh, question for the section before we transition over uh, to Dr. Moore. Okay, now, how closely will you try to adhere to the NCC frontline treatment guideline algorithm for ovarian cancer? Very loosely, loosely, somewhat closely, very closely, or I'm not a practicing healthcare provider. As we're waiting for that, the, the, uh, the people to answer those questions, um, I, I was trying to find the ESMO guidelines. So, so one of the audience as asked, you know, we're talking about the NCCN guidelines. Yeah. How, how do these guidelines differ from uh, uh, the European guidelines? So I know, Rob, you're the current president of IGCS. Um, uh, is there, I, I'm not aware of significant differences, but there's clearly differences between the ESMO guidelines and, and the NCCN guidelines. Right. So one of the ones that are ones that you know well, and that's the use of bevacizumab. So, right. So bevacizumab is still um, in many countries uh, in Europe is only uh, allowable for patients who have quote unquote high risk disease. So that would be a separate caveat into the use of, of bevacizumab. Um, in addition, uh, HRD testing is not uniformly uh, situated over there, or at least it's not done um, uh, it, it can be done in a, uh, uh, in a, in a university lab. Uh, so it's, it's, those guidelines are less strictly defined, but they generally follow these, uh, these guidelines in terms of, of decision-making. Uh, so if you have credible evidence for HRD testing, you, you would basically follow these same, these same, um, algorithms. Great. And you switch over the audience response. Somebody asked, you know, can you use niraparib in HR proficient or HRD negative tumors after CRPR? Absolutely. That's what we were, yeah. that's what we're talking we talk about, about that. every, mm -hmm. every for three years. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. And, and something to, to consider um, in those patients that you have not started BEV or a switch maintenance strategy. Okay. It looks like, um, you know, from the audience response that there are a lot of people that will um, follow the guidelines you know, closely or very closely. Um, and I think that's, I think that's fair. I think that the guidelines and Dave, you're, you know, as, as a, as a member of this committee, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's heartening to see that, uh, you know, that these are evidence-based decisions, um, you know, trying to make, uh, the best, uh, clarity, uh, uh clear, you know, high, provide high clarity for patients, given the wealth of data that we have. And, and we walked through a lot, uh, we spent almost an hour on it. So, um, 
hopefully uh, that was informative to the audience. And uh, um, and with that, I'll um, I'll close the section. Any any last minute uh, comments before we go over to the next one? I think the only thing I would say is that um, I, I make this sort of sort of joke when I'm presenting is that things have really changed. When I, mm -hmm. I was a fellow between 2004 and 2007, which is now a long time ago. And everyone, we operated on everyone, irrespective mm -hmm. of how much tumor they had, and everyone got taxol carbo. And that's it. Yeah. That's all we thought about. And then at the end of six cycles, you're like, okay, here we go. You know, there was there was nothing else. And and it's a very uh, much more nuanced discussion and a kind of reconsideration of those decision points that you made throughout a patient's journey. So for example, I'll give you one short example. If you are one that doesn't like to use bevacizumab all the time, which is okay, I don't die on the sword for that. I will on heart for BRCA though. Um, <laughs> but if you don't use that, okay. Yeah. And you start somebody with, with, you know, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and she's just not responding well. Um, and maybe she barely gets to the surgeon for surgery, or maybe she doesn't get to the surgeon for surgery. Her C125 is like creeping down. We know these women, we've met them. You're like mm. worried about yeah. you. cycle yeah. three. I'm going to go back and add Bev. Yeah. Honestly. Unless yeah. there's a contraindication, that's someone I'm going to change my plan on. Right. I'm still going to send all the biomarkers. I'm still going to look for all the things, but I'm going to change my plan if that's okay with her. Um, some patients decline bevacizumab, and that's okay. It's shared decision making. But I don't think you, I, I just don't want you to think it's one decision point. You've made the decision. You can flex during it because if she's not responding, that tumor has told you that she's not a prima patient. And so you can try and help her do a little bit better with bevacizumab, which yeah. works irrespective of homologous recombination status. It's not dependent on that. You get Correct. the same 30% reduction in the hazard of progression right. or death with Bev, irrespective of That's biomarker. Right. So That's think right. about that, you know, as you're seeing someone, again, if you get someone to no gross residual and they're on chemo, which is the best thing for a patient, you lose that clinical biomarker and you make the decisions based on the molecular biomarkers, which I fully mm -hmm. support. But 50% of our patients get neoadjuvant and you know who you're worried about and <laughs> absolutely it's like, yeah. yeah. And you're like, yes. Yeah, yeah I agree. Think I think about that. Think about yeah. the shifting. It's a right. fluid. Using, yeah, using discussion. all the tools. Yeah. Using all the tools at your, uh, at your disposal. I think that's uh, very good. And that's it really, it's really the art of medicine. So paying attention to what's happening. That's, yep. that's a great closing part. So um, I'm not going to uh, review everything we just did here in the closing, but I do think that I, we had an extensive discussion on the biomarker and how that can inform it, uh, inform treatment. And I think uh, I think I think we we covered it really well. Thank you for the discussion. But one thing we did not talk a lot about is immunotherapy, and I get this question all the time, right? Um, you know, we <laughs> patients come in all the time, like I want immune therapy because it works. You know, and they obviously there's commercials or we're inundated with commercials that basically show how wonderful patients do on immunotherapy. So Katie, maybe uh, you could walk us through, um, you know, immunotherapy and ovarian cancer, a tough, tough space, but uh, one I think is really um, helpful uh, to our audience to hear uh, how, how this has played out. Absolutely. I'm happy to, um, unlike your talk, which was full of positive trials, I have, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, like... it's not going to take me long, <laughs> but you're absolutely right. You know, patients come in and I'm a, I'm a phase one trialist primarily in Patients still come in really interested in immunotherapy. And I was like, you've probably heard about Keytruda or Opivo or Invinzi. And they're like, yes. So we talk about the mechanism and then we talk about the data. And, and that is illuminating to them because, you know, the commercials are like the chance to live longer with lung cancer. So they come in with these expectations that you have to temper a little bit. Um, but I don't think all is lost, but let's just look at what we've done so far, which is quite a bit. So this is monotherapy really just PD-1, PDL one monoclonal antibodies. I didn't include CTLA-4, which may be honestly our best agent in this class, um, but the toxicities have been limiting here. Um, we'll see what the next gen um, agents look like, but these are um, P1, PDL-1s. And uh, Ursula Machelonis's work, uh, which was at Keynote 100 at the bottom is the largest study, 376. So this was really a biomarker seeking study looking at def different levels of, um, the CPS score, trying to figure out if you could predict who would benefit. And unfortunately, you just really didn't. You know, we don't know the biomarker uh, if there is one, even in an ovarian cancer and in a recurrent setting, platinum resistant. Uh, you know, this is no better than monotherapy, cytotoxic chemotherapy with response rates that you can see, you know, in the 
kind of 10 to 15% range. The Atezo study was a little bit of an outlier and interesting, um, but the responses were clear cell. And so we're still interested in that pullout, but again, it just speaks to the niche development of ovarian cancer. In high-grade serous, this is a 10 to 15% response rate at best with no biomarker to really help us select who should, um, who should be uh, treated. Now to the last slide that you saw, which was on genetic testing, just to emphasize that there are new guidelines out from ASCO that I would encourage you to take a look at. And for high-grade serous, these biomarkers that do predict response to immunotherapies like MSI high is the one, less than 1%. It, you may find when I hear it again, um, and this is why we do next gen sequencing to you know save the one starfish on the beach. I would use it, um, but an endometrioid um, and mucinous, which has just no options, and to some extent, extent clear cell, we do want to send those those tumors off for testing um, because you may get a hit there. And here, immunotherapy may work. Those are rare subtypes. We're really talking about high grade serous, and what I'm going to talk to you about from here on out. Um, but you want to send the next gen to look for it. Again, we're always looking for the needle in the haystack. Heck, you guys are all looking for Intrek, which I've never <laughs> even seen on any NGS. And I send it on everyone. Never have had an Intrek fusion. <laughs> never, but no I'm going to have one one day. Um, so if you're looking for it. Intrek and you think that's important, please look for <laughs> MSI high and in, uh, endometrioid ovarian cancer. Um, but I digress. So, so interestingly, in the drug development world and ovarian cancer, unlike what you heard Rob talk about, which is we looked in recurrent C's, biomarker selected, monotherapy PARP, and it worked. 33% response rate, um, duration response was beautiful, got accelerated approvals, and we moved it on up the line. Here, we just got real excited kind of quickly. You know, so we didn't really have a signal in the recurrent setting, but despite that, we moved it right up front. Um, and you know, I'm being tongue in cheek about it now because I know the results and, 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 and in full disclosure, I'm the international PI for Imagine 50. So I was right on that bandwagon, you know, beating the drum um, that perhaps it didn't work in the platinum resistance setting because we had, you know, exhausted T cells and these patients tumors had been exposed to so many things that um, we weren't gonna see a signal unless we moved it uh, to the front line. And so we did two very large frontline studies of immunotherapy with chemo uh, on the left, you see Javelin 100, um, which used a Velumab. It's very much like GUG218 that uh, Dr. Coleman uh, presented to you. Uh, and then on the right, you see Imagine 50, which is a two-arm study of um, paclitaxel carboplatin bevacizumab and bevacizumab maintenance versus the same with atezolizumab. Uh, there's subtle differences in the design, but in general, um, um, they're a little bit similar. They're more similar than different. Very exciting um, studies, um, but unfortunately entirely negative. Um, and in fact, Javelin 100, they stopped early because the patients who received a Valumab as compared to those who didn't actually look like they might be doing worse. Those are the patients in the yellow um, curve. And so that's interesting and a little disturbing. In Imagine 50, we just didn't see any clinically relevant benefit. It was two months um, of, a, of a Tezo versus Bev. And so that was very disappointing. There were all sorts of exploratory subsets uh, and those are coming out. So it's a little bit embargoed, but you'll see the papers soon. Um, but there's really, uh, unfortunately across these programs, not a big signal of who should get IO in the front line for now. Um, but I'll show you some more data. So please don't do this. So why, what happened? You know, 14 approvals in PARP over, you know, since 2014, we've seen the same thing with eye immune checkpoint inhibitors in every other solid tumor except ovary. Like what happened? And, and really the bottom line is, is that unlike PARP, at baseline, these tumors are, have a very different immune microenvironment. It's probably very heterogeneous tumor to tumor, and they have a, lot, a, a much lower expectation of monotherapy response, which you need to see. And there's a lot of things in the microenvironment. And I've listed like the tip of the tip of the tippity tip iceberg here. There's so many other things. TAMS may be a huge one in mm -hmm. ovary, um, but you know, FAS ligand has been one of the postulated uh, tumor microenvironment factors that may impart resistance to immune therapy. But honestly, if that were the main feature, then um, imagine. Sorry about that. I'm gonna start using my hands. And I advance. 
Imagine 50 should have been positive. Like if that's the main driver, then I should have been over to come, overcome that with VEGF inhibition. Yeah. So it's clearly not. Um, and we really don't have biomarkers. The, um, the NCI put together a working group around immunotherapy uh, and did an exhaustive search of biomarkers in, um, in gynecologic cancers. And I'm not quite sure it's been published yet, but the bottom line is there's really not a selection criteria to use. And so we just don't know really what to do yet with at least monotherapy <clears throat> use. And so, so Katie, question, so, yeah. so, so I, 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 on that note that we have some questions coming in with regards to biomarkers. So you alluded to NGS testing for rare tumors, endometrioid mucinous, uh, clear cell, right? Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, you also said PDL one I think you're just going to make this point. So I wanted to grab you before you, you moved on. So tell the audience here, what are the biomarkers that you check in a high grade serous versus some of the others? Do you check PDL one Do you check MSI? Do you check MMR? Um, can, can you just, just tell us the audience, just what are you doing in a typical high grade serous versus some of the rare tumors? So, um, so I'm not checking PDL one at all. Um, it comes with, we, at our institution, we use a lot of foundation testing. And so we kind of get it automatically, but I don't even look at it because it's irrelevant. Um, and actually imagine 50 chip Landon is publishing this. He has presented it. So I can talk a little bit about it. Um, except for the very, high, very highest levels of PDL1 uh, expression as measured by that particular assay, which is entirely exploratory. There was absolutely no signal of patients who benefited from the addition of atezolizumab. And the same is true um, when you look at the value map data. So for high-grade serous, um, and probably for all the tumors, PDL1 just isn't our marker. Um, and we get, like I said, we send next-gen sequencing uh, because that's how we get our loss of heterozygosity testing. Again, we use the foundation assay and I'm not, please don't take this as a affirmation of that. That's just what my institution uses. Um, and then we get all the other stuff. You know, we get um, microsatellite instability uh, and other markers. So, so we are testing for that sort of indirectly because we get it on the, on the next-gen panel um, and we don't have to be directive about it. If I had to be directive about it, I would only be checking that really for my rare tumors. Um, but as it is, because of how, um, at least in the U.S., how accessible NGS is, we kind of get it on everybody. Yeah, and one thing you know to add to that, you know, the in, on, on this slide that you're showing, you can see that the TMB is obviously. Uh, I mean, checkpoint inhibitors are also approved for patients that have high TMB. The ovarian cancer is a, is a disease that's defined, the high grade series, defined by copy number alteration and not by mutational load. And right. you can see here, uh, it's a very nice graphic uh, showing where ovarian cancer sits with a, with a mutational count somewhere on the order of two, two to three mutations per megabase. So it, the, the, one of the major reasons it doesn't fit into what you see on TV is that the tumor is not driven that way. Right. So we're constantly trying to figure out a way to, to overcome these these barriers. And I, I think you hit it on one, you mentioned it quickly, but I think it's, it's really relevant. And that's the tumor associated macrophages, right. uh, which it can be actually enriched in the, in the, under the use of bevacizumab, especially the type of macrophages we see there. So yeah, there's much more work. We haven't cracked it yet. and certainly have not given up, but, um, but what you said about common use of immune checkpoint inhibitors, use of PDL one uh, for trying to determine who those patients are, or even the mutational load is just not there. Right. So, it's so, so market. genomic, genomic instability mm -hmm. test of some sort, Myriad right. Foundation, we've mentioned, right? Yes. We talked about extended germline testing for all patients. And in the <clears throat> rare tumors, clear cell, endometrioid, and mucinous, consider MMR or MSI um, and uh, potentially next generation sequencing, looking for some mm -hmm. of these other uh, rare tumors. That is not HRD testing, though. That is a different testing modality, looking a completely different set of in other rare tumors. So I just want to make sure we make that point with regards to the differences in, in what we're talking about, HRD versus other options of treatment, particularly in rare tumors. Yeah, I think that, yeah. um, and I wish we could talk about rare tumors. We're kind of running out of time, but um, I think probably most of the folks on this call are doing this already. NGS is so prevalent, um, but you will find, uh, you, you'll hit, especially in patients with mucinous, which is only 5% of our cancers, but they don't respond to chemotherapy 
uh, and they tend to have a very difficult course, but, you know, if you hit on an RBB2 amplification, mm -hmm. you know, or, or a RAS even, mutation or RAS now, when yeah. you can target mm -hmm. RAS now, it's even getting better and better. And yeah. triage those patients to trials, you actually can find things that will help them clear cell the same. And then mm -hmm. endometroid, you can hit upon these MSI high folks, um, tumors, and then they really respond beautifully. So uh, again, it's, it's not everyone, it's not common, but you do hit on these really actionable findings for them much more than high grade serous, much more. Yeah. Uh, so I would encourage you to not get nihilistic about NGS and ovary because uh, the rare tumors really need you to continue to look. Um, and so, so, you know, on this last slide, I just said, you know, it's, it's been kind of problematic and negative and lots of the reasons we thought it wouldn't work, you know, are probably not the real reasons that monotherapy chemo or monotherapy immune checkpoints haven't been incredibly efficacious. So the question is, can you combine them? And what, there's tons of combinations. Uh, actually, all of us run like hours of calls today talking about combinations in cervical cancer today. Um, but we're talking about ovary here. And so there's been a lot of um, combinations trying to synergize with immune checkpoint inhibitors as it, for most patients, they play well in the sandbox. Not, not all, of course, there's toxicity, but the PARP inhibitor combinations really have kind of beautiful preclinical rationale. The first, which is probably not true, but we all believed it for a while, is that patients who had this in inherent um, vulnerability to how their tumors repair their DNA. So homologous combination deficiency or other means by which their tumor's DNA just struggled to fix um, uh, mutations, there'd be more neoantigens and that would lead to this robust immune response. And I think we all can remember seeing the presentation at ASCO like in 2015 or 16 in, in BRCA models. And we're like, well, this is the group of patients who are gonna respond to immune checkpoint inhibitors because they have all these neoantigens. And that was shown preclinically, but it did not pan out clinically, interestingly. And that happens. Um, so that theory may be true, but it doesn't explain, it certainly doesn't predict who's going to respond to monotherapy immune checkpoint inhibitors um, and probably not combinations either, I'll tell you. But the, maybe the more correct hypothesis is that when you do have these tumors that have an inherent vulnerability, you do have damaged DNA, which will transfer from um, the nucleus to the cytoplasm. So you get this cytosolic DNA and that's what activates your stimulators of, inter of interferon genes or the sting pathway. And the sting pathway triggers this innate immune response. And so that may be truly synergistic. Um, and that's also been shown by many of our colleagues in beautiful preclinical work. Now, unfortunately it's not panned out clinically. And these two works were done by two of two people I actually respect hugely in the field, Panos Constantinopoulos and uh, Dr. Joyce Liu at uh, Dana-Farber, both of them are Dana-Farber. Panos ran Topacio, which is Norapurv and Pembro, and Joyce ran um, Opal, which is a multi-arm study, but this particular um, arm was Norapurv, Dostarlamab, and Bevacizumab, so a PARP, an IO, and Bev, and then Topacio was a PARP, an IO, of course, Pembro. And, number, and then platinum resistant, recurrent disease, both of these, similar criteria. And really the response rates are the same. Um, and when you think about drug development in the resistance setting, and we have benchmarks for sort of what's a signal that makes us say, well, this is something, I'm gonna take it forward into a bigger study. This is about half what we would want. So really very well done studies with beautiful um, translational work uh, that they've done, but not super exciting, to be honest. Uh, and there were patients with BRCA on these. You would have expected them to do amazing. You know, and they just didn't. So back to the drawing board with that. And it, and it may come down again to this idea, just like I mentioned at the beginning, that we're testing these immune checkpoint inhibitors and tumors that are already resistant to platinum. And there's something fundamentally that changes potentially with the tumor microenvironment that contributes mm -hmm. to that resistance. And so maybe if we looked at it earlier on, it would help, you know, the same theory we had with moving things to the front line. And so... Some, I would just hesitate to overinterpret this, but it is interesting. We are kind of excited about it. This is Mediola. So Mediola was done in BRCA wild type, but platinum sensitive, PARP naive, all those things. And in maroon, it's a triplet, just like Opal, what Dr. Liu did. 
uh, Olaparib, here's just different company, PARP, IO, BEV, Olaparib, Derva, BEV, versus the doublet, PARP, BEV, or PARP, IO, PARP, Derva. And, and these are all platinum sensitive, and then they were stratified by genomic instability score, by the myriad assay, positive meaning HRD, negative meaning HRP, and then unknown. And interestingly here, these are very small numbers, but look at the waterfall plot in the platinum sensitive group, these are both platinum sensitive populations, but look at the maroon group, only two patients didn't have some tumor shrinkage. And the response rate amongst those HRD was 100%, 10 of 10 patients. Now you'd expect that with a PARP in an HRD population, maybe not 100%, but <laughs> pretty high. But in the, in the HRP group, this genomic instability score negative, the, um, now remember this is BRCA wild type, the response is 75%. And you might say, well, that's just driven by the PARP, right? They're platinum sensitive. And you told me earlier that platinum sensitive, platinum sensitivity is the key biomarker for response to PARP. Well, I did tell you that, but look at the <laughs> doublet. The Laparab Derva is 17%, just like the other study. So this looks very different when you look at the two groups um, and gives us some hope that perhaps one of these frontline studies will be positive. So these are the four maturing frontline studies, um, three of whom have taxol carbo with or without BEV, actually one of them requires BEV, the other two with or without BEV, and BEV maintenance with an IO with a PARP. And so you're gonna have triplet maintenance tested potentially in three of these studies in a vast majority of the patients. Athena is a pure switch maintenance PARP versus PARP IO. And that will probably um, result first, we'll see. But the other three have a little longer to go. Uh, and so if that mediola signal is real, we may maybe marginally move the needle in HRD, but we may massively move the needle in the 50% of patients who are HRP. And that would change the whole hazard ratio of the trial. So I'm interested in that um, and excited, tentatively excited. I, I do lead first in the US, so I'm a little biased just so you know that. Um, I'm trying not to like oversell it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but I think these have to mature. So before we use another immune checkpoint inhibitor in the front line in any way, shape or form, these guys have got a, a, a result and kind of give us some sense of if there's any signal here or not with PARP. This is gonna be the proof in the pudding um, for big trials. So it's kind of an exciting time. Uh, probably in the next two years will be interesting. So with that, yeah, I think I Katie, turn before, it over to you. Yeah, 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 before we go back, let me um, uh, just go back to that, uh, that previous slide. You know, one of the things that, it's, that, you know, to emphasize here is that each of these trials, although they have a kind of a, a common theme of triplet therapy, they do have uh, different weighted patient populations. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and I think you mentioned this because in the, in the uh, genomics instability or you know, the stable uh, cohort, the HRD test negative patient populations, you know, we're gonna get a lot of information to help either confirm or, you know, or refute what you said in that, in that observational uh, trial in Mediola. So I agree. I, I think, you know, again, as we try to like, try to get excited about immunotherapy, find some place where it works. Um, you know, these trials will help us inform that. We'll have thousands of patients here with, uh, through these trials to be able to make that decision. So stay tuned and uh, let's see what we get. So, yeah. so with last five minutes here, for the last five minutes, this is, a, <laughs> a, this is not a loaded question at all. Uh, <laughs> are, are, are the PARP, uh, and we got asked two different ways, are the PARP, VEGF, and now somebody's added immune checkpoint inter inhibitors interchangeable? So, so why don't Rob, you start off with, um, you know, what, where are you using the different PARP? Are you using different VEGF? Um, and we just said, we're not going to use IO and ovarian cancer. So maybe we should just stick with the PARP and VEGF. So, um, so VEGF inhibitors, you know, come in, uh, several varieties. Um, the most common of which are the tyrosine kinase inhibitors and the antibodies. So, um, and of course, now there's biosimilars available for, uh, for the antibodies that are now approved um, in, in the United States. So in general, um, and of course, we don't have the head-to-head -head competition, but in general, it appears from the data that have, from the studies that have like over 12 that have used a TKI versus a trial in a similar patient population that have used uh, an antibody, uh, uh, particularly a uh, 
but the treatment effect seems to be larger with the antibody as opposed to the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Uh, and the toxicity profiles are different because most of the TKIs are have multiple multiple hits. So they're dirty kinase inhibitors that do affect more than one target, uh, which we initially we thought was going to be beneficial for patients uh, because it, 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 it attacks other elements within the tumor microenvironment, such as PDGFR uh, and FGFR. Uh, but we haven't really seen uh, a dramatic effect. And of course, there are none that are approved in the frontline state. So I think that um, for, for right now, our uh, it appears as though biosimilar bevacizumab and bevacizumab would be interchangeable. Um, and in some situations, some healthcare systems, that's already being done. Yep. So, um, so I think that's okay. With respect to the parts, we get oh, back. Oh, wait, wait, that, that, oh. let me throw this one to Katie. Let me throw this yeah. one to Katie. I, 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 Katie, what, how are you making differences? How are you differentiating the parts? Well, that's a good question. Um, we, so in the front line, you only have norepirib and olaparib. So far, we'll wait to see if Athena brings Rucaparib to the front line. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I really differentiate it honestly um, based on the indication right now. So for my patients where I, I said I like Bevacizumab, but I don't use it in everyone. And so if I have somebody, I have a lot of patients of terrible hypertension. You know, it's just mm -hmm. there are contraindications and they respond beautifully to chemo. I'm going to put them on Norepirib because that's mm -hmm. my indication for everyone who's not BRCA. So I, I have to be... My office is very smart at using Neraprib and watching the weekly labs and watching the platelets. Uh, and I have a team, very lucky. And then Olaprib, you know, I use um, for anyone that's HRD positive with Bev so that I can use the Paola regimen, which I actually like a lot, especially in BRCA wild type HRD. That's my favorite regimen. Uh, I will be biased there and tell you that. And then in all my BRCA associated uh, tumors, I'm probably more likely. Oop. <laughs> There you are. <laughs> Katie, just, Katie just fell oh, off no. her chair. She got those hands going. She's changing the slides. She's moving the camera. I'm in a hotel room and I have my computer balanced on an ice bucket. So I'm like, I made it all, I made it two minutes from it's the end. Melting. It's melting. Up, but um, here I am. So um, there's no ice in the bucket, just so you know that. So I, I you know, I, I use it that way. And then I, I also make decisions just based on perceived patient tolerance, you know, I, I think it's just real world patients. Some patients come in and they're like, I can't take oral medication. I've always struggled to swallow pills and they're not lying to you. They right. really do struggle. And so mm -hmm. for them, Neraparib is probably an easier medicine to use. It's once a day once and a the day. pills are quite small. Mm -hmm. And most patients start with two um, rather than three. Um, some patients have terrible hypertension and I use, I won't use Neraparib because you can have um, hypertension there. It's like, I use both. I think they're both very good agents. They're very active. Um, I don't think there's no difference in efficacy in my mind between them. So it's very patient driven. Well, we, we had a couple more questions, but I see we're up at the hour. So uh, Rob, I'll turn it over to you to, to, to bring us home, buddy. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dave. And thank you for monitoring those questions. I just wanted to, um, uh, you know, first thank everybody uh, who joined tonight and to my, and to my two, uh, 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 friends who uh, helped to walk us through these slides. I think I'm just going to show these summaries here that, you know, I think we've, we have uh, convinced ourselves that, you know, pac Paxil Carplatinum still is a standard baseline for us and that we're, it, we have definitely reached a kind of a ceiling with that without the addition of our biologics. We, and we've seen measurable impact from Bevacizumab and from uh, uh, our better use of, of molecular annotation of these tumors, either through HRD uh, uh, testing uh, and through uh, BRCA1-2 uh, status uh, in, in the tumor and in the germline. I think you heard from both of all, all three of us about how we approach that in the frontline setting. It's very important to get that information. And as Katie uh, uh, closed us out, uh, demonstrating that um, although we've not, we've not been able to find the right place for immunotherapy, the current crop of trials are going to be very informative in, I think, in very clearly defined populations as to where whether or not these particular drugs actually have um, have merit, so stay tuned uh, to that to that particular uh, um, uh, for those results to come. So just let me just read off these SMART goals. I had to actually write this on my board. I think I still have it on my board uh, of what SMART stands for. <laughs> these are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. Um, these are goals that I have been using my on my teams as well uh, for different uh, objectives, but. Our, our SMART goals for today were that, or, that we should order early tumor genetic testing, 
uh, to determine the BRCA and HRD status for all of our cancers. Uh, we should adhere to the treatment guidelines that incorporate these uh, biological features, MSI or MMR and TMB to inform treatment. And again, and, we, and all three of us on this, I know I, I speak for them that we recommend that, that if you have the opportunity to participate, uh, have your patient participate on a clinical trial, that uh, you do so. And our, 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 and these trials that we just mentioned are really there uh, only because we have uh, had the, the generous participation of our, our patients uh, to who have uh, participated on these trials. And they will uh, provide us information about uh, PARP inhibitors and immune checkpoint inhibitors. So, um, you know, uh, we are uh, open to answer questions um, after the show. Uh, here is your, uh, your resource for doing that. Um, and hopefully you were able to uh, take advantage of not only the CME credit, but also the slides. And we hope that you will um, uh, 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 have those available to uh, get those uh, from us uh, or get them from the platform. Again, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Moore and Dr. O'Malley. Uh, it was great to share the stage with you guys. And uh, thank you to all the audience for participating and providing those questions.